Today is the 2nd of December. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. We are doing a home interview today in Gilderland, New York. Ma'am, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Wilma, Wilma May Malachek Jensen. And I was born in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, October 21st, 1927. Did you uh, grow up in Cedar Rapids? I did. I did. I graduated high school. And what year did you graduate? Oh, 46. Okay. And let me, let me just go back a little bit. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes, yes. We had, um, it was a Sunday afternoon, of course, and we were listening to the radio, and the program was interrupted, and uh, the announcement was made about Pearl Harbor. And immediately we became very upset because we knew several families in the neighborhood who would be affected. It was really a hard moment. We were, I was one of five daughters, mm -hmm. and, um, and my father had just been killed in an airplane accident just before, in June of 41. Mm -hmm. And um, we all took it very seriously because my father was born in Czechoslovakia and had uh, come to this country as a 14-year-old boy and had very strong feelings about uh, his, his country. Mm -hmm. um, we had no idea at the time how it was going to affect us, what was going to be happening. They talked about rationing immediately, and um, it was very scary particularly somehow or another looking back at that moment, looking at the fact that we were all women living, mm -hmm. living together and a scary time with no strong male mm -hmm. there to kind of um, cry on his shoulder or say, what do we do next? Thank now, was your mother the, the breadwinner at that she point? She was the breadwinner. She was working working in a local meatpacking plant. Uh, mm -hmm. Cedar Rapids had several meatpacking plants. The, the Czech people were known to be very, um, uh, have, have a good um, work ethic. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, um, many, many Czechs had come to Cedar Rapids, there were about 75% of the population was Czech. And uh, we had our own schools, library, butcher shops, banks, etc. All of the um, all of the services were available in Czech. In mm -hmm. fact, when, when I would get out of school uh, on a, a Friday, on Monday I would start Czech school. It was um, it was an interesting time as I look back on it. Scary, as I mm -hmm. said. Interesting in that um, people people in the community were very tight knit, and looking at that and how it uh, how it helped to give us uh, some sense of security in spite of the fact that we'd lost our our big breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And my father was, as I look back, and of course I was 12 years old when he died, so I didn't ever really get to know the man. He was. Now your father was studying to be a commercial pilot? He was. He mm -hmm. had just gotten his commercial license like a month before he was killed. In fact, he was killed in an accident with a student. He was uh, had flown from a small community. At that time, we were living in... Um, Fargo, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. We had moved to Fargo. My um, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade years of, of elementary school and junior high were in Fargo, and um, it was um, it was an interesting change of community because here we were in a very agricultural um, community when I was growing up in Cedar Rapids, but moving to Fargo. 
um, it was prairie, and there were very few jobs available. Mm -hmm. Looking back at that, was uh, Fargo's become a big town now, but it was a sleepy little prairie town at the time, and um, it was um, it was a time to reorient ourselves and where were we going next. Mm -hmm. Um, fortunately, my mother's parents were still living in Cedar Rapids, and we moved back there just to be near some security, mm -hmm. um, looking for a place to live, uh, starting a new school, um, and I, I would like very much to show a picture of, of, sure. of the accident that my father had. And, um, yeah, if you hold that up right in front of you, I can zoom right in on it. Okay. I'll zoom in on the uh, he was on your father a, first. He was a relatively young man, 37 years old, and uh, he wanted very much to get into the war effort and help his uh, native country of Czechoslovakia. And uh, of course, it, I think. It had to have been a trial and a tribulation to him to have had five daughters and no sons because the European uh, feeling was always, yeah, I want sons. And that whole image of, um, I guess, that I had, the feeling that I had, it was, uh, he, I think he felt a little strange around all the girls. And we had very, very different uh, feelings of protocol at that time, how daughters uh -huh. would behave in the presence of their father. Uh, I think it led me to, um, to do some different kinds of things in my life um, because of that feeling early on um, of, of being not oh, being what I should have been. You know, mm -hmm. the first girl probably was okay, but I was the second girl coming along. And subsequently, when I was 18, I wanted very much to take um, flying lessons. Mm -hmm. And my mother, no, cried, no, no, and no. And finally, I wore her down, which I knew I would. <laughs> finally, she said, um, "Well, you go ahead and you go ahead and do it, but please be careful." And of course, now as a parent, I can understand her strong feelings. But she was a pretty special mom, looking back. And um, I did um, go and, and take flying lessons and soloed. Mm -hmm. It was a, a wonderful time, of course, along with having that, that image of my dad flying and loving it, loving it. So he had taken all of we girls up in the plane, mm -hmm. and um, that was quite an experience because here I was like 11 when he soloed mm -hmm. and was able to take up a, um, a passenger. It was uh, pretty amazing. In fact, I took along my dog when I when he first took me out. Oh, really? I had a little rat terrier, a little tiny guy, and he was shivering, and I was um, I was trying to hold my own, as it were, because it was quite it was bumpy that day. Somehow or another, it was felt bumpy. Do you remember what kind of airplane it was? Oh yes, Piper Cub. Oh, okay. There were Piper Cubs and there were Arancas. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were the planes that were available for, for use in uh, taking lessons. Now was this uh, when you got your, did you actually get a pilot's license? Or? I did. I soloed and logged about uh, 18 or 20 uh, hours of flying time before I met the man I married. Now, now, did you get your pilot's license during the war? It was right after the war. Oh, okay. It was right after the war. I had a, a very strong drive to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think beside the fact that my father had been a pilot, I think that was the high time for um, Amelia Earhart. Right. And she was a wonderful, 
role model for young women to get out and, mm -hmm. and do things. And uh, was the beginning, I think, of the revolution that culminated in the 60s when yeah. so many, so many uh, old ideas um, fell, fell to new ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, um, it it was um, it was a big time. I had that was before I I married that I did all of these things. Mar my first marriage and. Um, my husband refused to let me go out to the airport and do anything with my flying. Oh no, no wife. And I realized years later that he was afraid of flying. He never was up in a plane. And because I was the dutiful wife, I, uh, I mm -hmm. gave in to all of that. And besides, we had a family right away. Mm -hmm. And I was busy and I kind of gave up. I, kept thinking, well, one day I may get back to flying, which was just a joy. Mm -hmm. Now you were flying Piper Cubs? I, uh, yes. Uh, occasionally there would be an Aranka there. Mm -hmm. And I got, after I soloed, I could go out and go up any time. Otherwise I had to fit it with my instructor's time. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was terribly exciting to have that added dimension and uh, to go up. And along the way, before that happened, I uh, I knew the war effort was strong in terms of society, even in the Midwest. And I felt a very strong need to contribute something, since mm -hmm. we were five girls and none of the boys could go and, and enlist. I, um, I quit high school and went to work in a war plant thinking that this was a good thing. And it was for the time. It was a, a very dramatic experience because I hate to say, but I they, they were told in the um, intake office not to ask me my age. Oh, so, so you were underage? I was underage. Oh. And I was like the baby of the whole plant. Now was this in 44 or 45? This, this or? was, um, yes, 44 and 45 because uh, in a year's time I realized something that my grandfather had told me over and over and over again as a, a very young child. Now they can take your land away from you, they can burn your house down, but they can never take away your education. You mm -hmm. must get an education. So. After a year of working in the war plant, which was a very maturing, shall we say, experience. Now what did the plant uh, produce? The, the plant had been a, uh, uh, they made uh, farm machinery. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy for them to change all of the machinery and they manufactured, um, um, oh dear, um, Senior moment. <laughs> we we made um, we made all of the equipment for the Pacific invasions, um, particularly uh, outfitting the CBs for all of their work. Mm -hmm. uh, we had contracts that would um, would call for ten hours a day, seven days a week, getting materials ready, the machinery ready to ship out. Now, did you operate a machine or? Oh yes, I operated several different kinds of machines. It was a new experience to go in that you start out in a labor pool mm -hmm. and you don't have much of a salary at that point. But as, as you're there and you acclimate and you uh, come to know some of the machinery that's available, then you bid on when there's an opening, whether somebody quits or whether they've added more machines to a particular category. Mm -hmm. um, and I had different shifts. Women were just coming into this particular plant and it was interesting. Uh, you had to wear steel-toed shoes. You had to wear your hair up constantly, like Rosie the Riveter, all of mm -hmm. the... Uh, that was what I looked like. <laughs> It was, uh, it was interesting, and uh, as I said, women were just being um, brought in. 
you had to join the union. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, I'm paying my union dues every week. They're taken out of my salary. I need to go to a union meeting. Oh, my goodness. There were fist fights in a union meeting. Men got up and were so heated. So I sat back in the corner. I went to two union meetings, and I said, I'm not going back again. It's not helpful to me. I don't, I don't learn anything. I don't feel a part of this because mm -hmm. this um, union feelings were very, very strong. It was quite a, 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 an effort for me to just keep my mouth closed and stay in the background of, of all of this. And I think that that too was the beginning of, I, I've had a, a, an aversion to violence mm -hmm. and raised two boys who did not have water pistols or guns of any kind, cap pistols, water guns, whatever, just feeling that we've got to somewhere change, change our attitude toward, um, toward violence, which is still very deeply ingrained. Um, now, when, when the war ended, what happened? Did, did they close the factory, or did the women lose their jobs? Very or? soon after uh, the uh, war ended, yes, there were, um, there were many people who left the plant who mm -hmm. just were happy that the war was over with and they could go back to living a life, just a, an ordinary life. I think about Andy Hardy and all of the movies that, that were made around that era and uh, that kind of family. They wanted to get back to that, a, a, a simpler mm -hmm. direction. Well, it's like we solved that problem and now let's get back to our own lives. Um, it was, uh, there were women who were kept on, who mm -hmm. wanted to work. There was quite a, a variation of the kind of woman. There were women who were doing it only because of the patriotism. They felt they were really, as myself at the mm -hmm. time, uh, we were helping the war effort. We were doing something. Um, I remember vividly my father, when he was still uh, living, um, reading in the newspaper about what was happening in Czechoslovakia. And there was a, a small community called Lidice, and the whole, the whole community was lined up and gunned down because somebody had snitched and, uh, to the Germans uh, from the community. And so they, it, was, it was a terrible moment. My father, I, I like to say he became a roaring lion. He was so upset with what was happening and he felt he wanted to do something but because he was 37, 36 at the time there was no way they were going to take a man who had five children mm -hmm. and um, but that was um, it was an ugly time people were every place in the world seemed to be doing bad things to one another um, it was quite a time It was interesting to me to think about um, um, my second marriage here with, uh, with my husband having been a, a veteran of World War II and being in the theater. That, now, your first husband wasn't a veteran? No, he was not. He, okay. he was a forever, as mm -hmm. I came to find out. He was a six-foot-two man, looked hale and hearty, but when they checked out his... Uh, his physical, he had problems mm -hmm. and uh, was not able to serve at all. Um, he, was, he looked strong, but he wasn't. Mm -hmm. and my second husband looks like a small man, but he's a very strong man. Mm -hmm. It's another interesting little thought. Mm -hmm. um, I was... Um, I was married a short time to my first husband. We had three children, two boys and a girl. And I decided after a divorce that I needed to um, make a plan for a life. 
and um, I started college when they were two, three, and four years old with not much money. I like to say I, a lot of people went to college on a shoestring. I went on half a shoestring. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, now, did you get any kind of government aid because I, you were a single woman with three there, children? There was in Iowa. They had what they called aid to dependent children. Mm -hmm. So I did get. I got twelve hundred dollars a year. That was my only regular income. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, um, I had done well in high school. So my uh, my resume was uh, starting out well, and I, I qualified for this full-time scholarship at Drake University in Des Moines. I had to move from Cedar Rapids and uh, go to Des Moines, and um, because Drake had uh, the kind of program that would fit my schedule. Cedar Rapids had summer, summer school for college students, but they had no night classes at that mm -hmm. time. and. Um, so I started out with um, one of the funny moments was I, when I went through registration the first day I signed up for a seminar on early childhood development because my children were two, three, and four years old. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this would be helpful to me as a mom and it would contribute to my, um, my degree. Well, this was only for seniors. <laughs> I went through a registration line and, and the, the person who fi had to finalize my application said, well, what other courses have you had? And I said, this is my first. And she said, well, I'm sorry, you can't take this. <laughs> so I wanted to start out with the most difficult. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was an interesting time again because to live on very little money, and I was very fortunate. I qualified for, um, oh, what was it called, surplus food. They didn't have uh, the arrangement now with uh, coupons and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, you got surplus food once a month. And I was a pretty good cook and baker, and we got the best, I have to say. The surplus food was not heavily processed. The cheese was real cheese, the, the flour was unbleached flour, mm -hmm. and um, my children to this day remember eating a lot of pancakes and a lot of cornbread. And amazingly, we were all very healthy. We mm -hmm. did not have any health problems. And I think about all of the information that's come out today about um, nutrition. Yeah, we were definitely right there with it. Uh, the only problem we had, we didn't have a lot of fresh fruit, mm -hmm. but certainly everything else was um, very good. And it was, um, again, an interesting time. Uh, we, I, I paid a little more for rent so I could live on campus, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to uh, spend so much time transporting and leaving the kids, I had a wonderful woman who um, took care of the children from my church. They, she came whenever I had a class due. Well, of course, all of this also meant when do I study, because with little ones, sure. you don't study during the day. <laughs> you study from 10 at night to 2 in the morning. And uh, so in terms of sleep deprivation, there was plenty of that. I, I look back and I think, oh, I learned how to. I had learned during my time at the war plant that I could lay down on a wooden bench with nary a, a, a soft cushion, just a plain wooden bench, and sleep for 20 minutes and be refreshed. Now, today they talk about power naps. Yeah. I knew about power <laughs> naps early on. It was, <laughs> it was wonderful. Hmm. So I was very lucky. It was it was quite a, an experience. Well, and, and my my being a, a bit of an adventuring person, I uh, one of my professors at Drake encouraged me to as soon as I finished my bachelor's degree to come to New York City and get my master's degree at Columbia because that's 
the nirvana of good education. John Dewey, who is one of our great philosophers uh, in the educational field, who pioneered learn by doing. Mm -hmm. Children need to be experiencing something in a concrete way to do the, the I like to say uh, during my professional years, to make sense out of those hand scratchings that we call words is not an easy transition for most of us. And um, we, uh, we do a disservice to kids to expect them to be on a level a after first grade. Mm -hmm. They really need, uh, many of them need to have a couple more years before they're mature enough to make that transition. So I, I believed my professor and I made the arrangements. And I borrowed $500 from my mother, which was due back in six months. And we moved to New York City, living in um, city housing. There had been a new project that had just been built in Manhattan, very uh, like three blocks from Columbia. It was mm -hmm. a bit of a walk. Those blocks were long city blocks. And, um, and I was to teach in Harlem, uh, central Harlem, because we were living right on the fringe. It was a wonderful experience again. So you were, uh, you were working as a teacher and then going, going to, to school to get your master's yes. at the same time. Yes, yes. Okay. Taking night classes and then during the summer, the children went back to stay with grandma in, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I could, uh, I could work and take a couple of classes during the summer also. Um, the children were at that point uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh mm -hmm. graders and becoming very dependable people. Uh, I needed them to, to be independent and to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that today they're 60, 61, and 62, and they're good people. They're all homeowners. Mm -hmm. Their children are all homeowners and uh, good citizens. And um, But again, it was uh, starting teaching in New York City. That was in 59, and the then Mayor Wagner made the statement publicly that anybody, any family of four living on less than $5,000 a year was in the poverty level. And that year, my starting salary as a teacher was $4,800. And the good thing about that was it, we qualified for um, public housing. And this project had just been put up, a 20-story um, building, six of them, and in order to um, uh, assess the numbers of children, they found that it would take two elementary schools to be built to, to take care of those children. And fortunately, mm -hmm. here I was, you know, in the, in the right place at the right time. And we, um, not only was Columbia close, you know, just three blocks walk, but we started Riverside Church, which was an interdenominational um, um, church that Mr. Rockefeller had built for a um, a rebel, a rebel minister mm. uh, who had been a me Methodist minister, and um, he was thrown out of his church. And Rockefeller liked him so much that he built this 22-story. A wonderful church that served any denomination, any denomination could come, and it's what to, even today it's still one of the wonderful parts of New York City. So um, they had, the, for example, they had a Sunday school for three hours. Children got snacks, they got exercise. It was planned around a developmental level which, of course, I thought was just magnificent. And um, we, had, we had a very interesting population. They had planned to have one-third, um, well, we, we say African-Americans today, 
had one third Hispanic and one third white. Mm -hmm. And they got most of their white population from the colleges that were right in the area. Columbia, the Union Theological Seminary, City College. It was a, a very heady time. It was the 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, my children were all in high school. It was pretty interesting to say. Now, that. now were you married to Braun at that time? Or? I was not. I was a single mother. Mm -hmm. And um, I met Braun. Um, oh, let's see. We, um, we got to know each other because um, Braun's brother-in-law was a videographer for um, PBS and he came to do a uh, um, documentary a documentary at, at my school and it was to be called Marked for Failure because they were just beginning to expose the inadequacies of education for our black population. Mm -hmm. And where did that begin and why did it begin? And um, it was an hour-long documentary. Uh, I got to know uh, uh, Dan Klukertz, who was doing, he was in charge of the project. He was in our school for a couple of months. And I was teaching sixth grade at that, that year. And um, I, uh, I had a couple of girls who thought, this man, you know, with the camera and all of these things was very special. And um, they carried his cameras around the, the building for him. And, uh, and he took a liking to them. Mm -hmm. And he had a couple of daughters of his own out on Long Island. And he invited me to bring the two girls out for a day. And uh, we, we spent two different days like that. Uh, with him and his family. And then he had a, um, a screening of a second uh, documentary that he had done. Um, it was called uh, An Uneasy Life, and it was documenting the dilemmas and anxieties of the working mom. And, of course, most of these were working moms who had a husband also. Mm -hmm. I was the only one who... Um, had a different arrangement. Well, at, at that, um, at the party, at the screening party, they, I was invited, of course, and, um, and Braun was invited. And um, that was how we met. Um, it was uh, a long courtship because mm -hmm. I had my own, as the kids say today, my own issues and dealing with three teenagers in the 60s um, under the circumstances was pretty difficult and I knew mm -hmm. that I couldn't handle a new marriage and and three teenagers. <laughs> it was an impossibility. So uh, it progressed very slowly, our courtship, and uh, stops and starts. And But I guess it must have been fate mm -hmm. that intended and finally we um, I took a job uh, my daughter the youngest of the three had uh, just uh, finished high school and had a scholarship to a, one of the city colleges and um, I was offered a job with one of the colleges uh, living in Elmira and um, and I thought I was ready for that I needed a change of pace and I needed not to be in the apartment where I had had those three wonderful kids and uh, I spent many an evening weeping, lonesome, and uh, so um, I took the job in Elmira and uh, I was on uh, I was on staff with the college for a year where I traveled and did consulting had a program in early childhood called Follow Through, Follow Through on Head Start. Mm -hmm. Head Start was for the four-year-olds, and, and we were dealing with five, six, and seven-year-olds trying to maintain the level of service 
for those kids who had done so well with, with their follow through or their Head Start experience. Now, now were these uh, poverty stricken children? These were all poverty kids, yes, mm -hmm. in the ghetto, in mm -hmm. the ghetto. And it was another interesting thing for me to uh, discover that, you know, everywhere there are pockets of poverty. I went to Huntsville, Alabama. I went to Boulder, Colorado. Rochester, New York. Plattsburgh, New York. I knew the New York programs. There were 11 New York, New York State programs. And, um, and the issues were the same. Uh, that poverty really denies so much to our young kids. And uh, how do we, can we? And how do we overcome that in, in the education field? What do we do? And unfortunately now with um, budget tightening, we're going to see more and more uh, cuts with all of that. So anyway, I went off to Elmira and, um, and that was another uh, experience, wonderful looking at, at where in the world is the poverty in Elmira, New York? Well, it got worse while I was there because we had a flood, a big flood, and many businesses died, and jobs, there weren't jobs. And uh, lo and behold, that was when Bron and, Bron and I decided that we couldn't live without each other. And he came to Elmira, and we were married there, mm -hmm. and, and spent a year uh, until... Uh, I had a job offer with the, the state education department, and uh, my job was to, a wonderful word, proliferate follow through in the state with no additional money. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> you really have to look at a philosophy, and how can we change the philosophy of our schools? And. Um, we moved here to, uh, to Albany in the fall, and the following March, our president, Mr. Nixon then, called a big meeting out in Denver, Colorado, to announce that he was cutting the funding for follow-through. Now, what year was this? Uh... Oh, this was 70... Um, Approximately. 72, it was okay. 70, 72, 73, and um, it was, um, it was a blow. It meant my salary was taken care of for the rest of that academic year, and then fortunately I'd had the foresight, and then I believed deeply that we need to have um, a variation in our training, no matter where, what level we're we just need that mm -hmm. uh, to be a well-rounded person, plus be prepared to take different jobs. And uh, my my uh, master's degree at Columbia was in special ed, which was a very new direction for education and, and new to get graduate degree in. Um, and uh, so I fell back on that when uh, when I was confronted with looking at uh, something different. And I, I took a job with um, O.D. Heck. And at that time, uh, O.D. Heck had been built to house um, people. And the new, the new director then was a man from Canada who, uh, who had been a psychiatrist, and he did not believe in, um, in uh, having people live in an institution. That was not the right thing. We need to have these folks out in the community. We need to have programs at the facility, but they need to live mm -hmm. in a facility, in a home, whether it's an artificially created home, group homes came into being, um, I was hired because of a new uh, a new law had been passed, PL 94-142, and that said every child shall be educated to his or her potential. 
which means even those severely handicapped have a, a, a right to be educated as far as they can be. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, we had about 15 children at the time that had never been out of their home because there was no program for them. There was nothing, they thought nothing could be done for these kids, all the way from little ones who were three or four years old, who were non-ambulatory um, and non-verbal, uh, all the way to a 14-year-old who was still being kept in a, a stroller, a children's stroller, at that stage of her life. And this was in a household where both parents were college educated, but they didn't understand about what could be done for this young woman. I mean, she was a young woman already. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she had never eaten table food. She'd only been given baby food. And to explain to parents that there's a reason that we give um, solids to children because they have to move their mouth and those are the beginning of the beginnings of language. And um, mom, they, had, they, they went every summer to Maine. They had never gotten a bathing suit for this girl. And when I said we would be taking her into a pool twice a week, uh, she, Mom said, oh, she doesn't have a bathing suit. I said, that's all right. We have extras. We'll outfit her fine. And Mom, with tears in her eyes, said, oh, no, I never thought that I'd be able to go and buy a bathing suit for Claire. So it was baby steps for these parents. But we got a program going, and um, it was one of the joys of my professional life that um, I had the superintendents had to come and view the program because even to bus these children was a job mm -hmm. because most of them were in wheelchairs and very securely uh, in the in the wheelchair, and uh, that was a novelty, particularly for this child that I, mom rode the bus with her a couple of times just to feel secure that mm -hmm. this was going to be okay. It was, um, it was, it was exciting for me to be able to do these things, to have the power to be creative to do, at, at, and as an educator, mm -hmm. to know that these children can be educated and climb a ladder in terms of abilities just to be able to sit at a table and eat mm -hmm. was a big effort and, and to get parents, a couple of those parents, to accept that, that this child could be at their family table eating mm -hmm. with everybody else. It was, and so um, that, was, that was wonderful. And finally, um, these superintendents coming out to evaluate the program, which by law they had to do, and one in fact I still have it in my memoirs. <laughs> I have a letter from the one superintendent who said, It's clear to see that Mrs. Jensen does not understand the philosophy of the public school and she thinks this program can be kept in a public school setting. Well, one of the greatest joys a few years later, I was um, in a position where in a in a public elementary school where a program that BOCES had started was right there, two doors from my office, handling children who were multiply and severely impaired, just like the program I had started. And mm -hmm. fought so many people, except I didn't have to fight my superintendent, my supervisor. My supervisor was thrilled. She said, Wilma, that's why you were hired, to sweep up the dirt and get going. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was one of the big rewards of, of, of my professional life. It was quite wonderful. And I have to say, I, I ended my professional life by um, supervising student teachers at St. Rose. 
and at, and at Hudson Valley, and it was the better of all the worlds that I had participated in professionally. Mm -hmm. um, was able to be in the classroom looking at children and talking with prospective teachers about what was important happening. What was, how did you plan that lesson? Why did you do it this way or that way? And to really be a part of that was um, uh, gratifying. And not only as a teacher uh, in that setting, but as a parent who uh, has seen many needs in our public school setting. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, we, I keep saying, we know how to teach. Let us teach. There are so many rules and regulations today in our educational setting that um, we uh, were uh, manic manacling our, uh, our, our teachers. Our teachers don't have the freedom to be their creative self. We know they have good training. We have some of the best schools right here in the Capital District, some of the best teaching schools for uh, preparing would-be mm -hmm. teachers. Um, so at, at, at my stage of life, it's uh, we're still looking, we're still examining, we're still um, trying to find our way. Some of our things that we've done have been, uh, we, we know, as I said, we know how to teach. Um, we're just um, a little handicapped by mm -hmm. rules and regulations. And, of course, now with budget issues that are going to create serious problems. And what year did you retire? Oh, boy. I tell you, I full-time retirement was um, um, like 82, but then I did uh, adjunct work. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, the supervision of, of uh, student teachers was adjunct work, and I taught some uh, courses along the way, adjunct courses, that were wonderful fun. Uh, because again, you, you don't have the restraint of um, uh, rules and regulations. We can just, are we close to Oh, no, no, no. Um, it just seems we take uh, two steps forward and three back at times. And uh, would it be that uh, it weren't so that we'd keep building? But this whole teaching process is a a cumulative effort, and um, and I guess to some extent I feel like I'm still teaching a little bit. The fella down the block was starting a garden, and there were some things that I, I used to do a lot of gardening. I grew a lot of our own vegetables here, but as time passed and my physical limitations grew to such an extent I couldn't do it any longer, means I still can pass on a few clues and mm -hmm. ideas here and there. And so that's good. And that's always been, there have always been people that pass on some good information. Sure. And, uh, but I guess, um, I guess our interview has really been just talking about a life, a life. And, and as you were talking about the person that you talked with on Monday, we all have such different fulfillments. Mm -hmm. of, uh, That's what's great about this program. Everybody has is, is got a different story. They've had similar experiences, uh, be it sometimes in civilian life and in war time. Um, you might have several people that have, were in a battle together, but I mean everybody's so on did something a little bit differently. So, so everybody's uh, individual story is very unique. And that's what's great about this program. Well, I appreciate uh, being a part of it because uh, I think you're right. And, and again, hopefully along the way, somebody will get some insight about whatever it is. Mm -hmm. 
I think back about uh, so many of the um, the steps along my life's way, and uh, and because you get to the point where you're thinking about distilling it all and what value you know. Now we have great grandchildren, a 14 year old great granddaughter, and um, uh, it's uh, to keep the relationship strong enough so this child is going to be a listener mm -hmm. and and caring about and uh, uh, she has uh, on on the other side of her family she has um, family that are quite well off and I can't Bron and I can't compete with that and early on when she was like two or three years old I just said you know we have to give her something unique and what we did was every Friday when she was finished with her daycare or um, uh, school mm -hmm. as she progressed along the way, I picked her up there when she got out 3.30 and she would spend the evening with us until around 9 o'clock when her parents would come to pick her up. And we did that for years. So we have a very close bond with that girl because so many things we shared because uh, we I would plan after we'd have our meal together and she loved being in the kitchen when I was doing can mm -hmm. I do that grandma and um, uh, loving to do all of those things and uh, it's something she'll always remember is a part of her yes mm -hmm. I, I believe that and, uh, and and it's proving to be true today and she's in the midst of uh, the teenage dilemmas. <laughs> mm -hmm. 14 is not an easy year. I remember my daughter and then two of the granddaughters going through that period of time. Oh my, well the two granddaughters are both married, homeowners, mm -hmm. career people. Um, it's um, it's amazing to watch, and, and, and the program, I hope the program can continue to um, chronicle uh, the uniqueness of, of folks around. Mm -hmm. it, hopefully it will. <laughs> hopefully it will. It's, um, and, and now we're at this, Bron and I are at this juncture of life where uh, um, the focus has become intense and very small <laughs> it's um, what's going to happen next we can't know and uh, again with budget cutting everywhere um, and we tremble at looking at our kids and the grandkids who are going to uh, have very different dilemmas from what mm -hmm. we experienced, but hopefully the strength of character that they've all developed is going to be um, be their strong point mm -hmm. to hang on to. So um, I'm sure it will. Well, that's that's our hope. Yeah. And if there is such a thing as a legacy, that's we we've, we've worked hard. To live our lives and um, and move in in our own direction, both Bron and I, and with his creative bent, um, as we've talked a lot, he's uh, he has a young man who just retired, that not so young, 62, but he's come down from Clifton Park three or four times already and um, gotten an art lesson. Huh? <laughs> and uh, he wants so badly to paint and of course he looks at bronze and he thinks he can you know he feels bad because he can't do that yeah and I tried to reassure him that that bronze gift was something that came along when he was five and six years old and it's just been developed along yeah. the way and that his his gift is going to be slower but, and it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very different. Oh, he wants so much and he works so hard and, and the talent is, 
it's so different and to be to be happy with that is <laughs> going to be I told Bron that's our job that we have to be encouraging enough so that this budding artist at 62 can develop something for himself yes. to be proud of and pleased about and uh, and also just a little bit about view and, and interestingly enough he's the father of five girls oh <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I have smiled about that I think that is really Mm. It gives me, he's a very, very different man than my father was. Very different. He really seems to enjoy being the father of five girls. Mm -hmm. And they're all college directed oh, people. Sure. And that's his important mm -hmm. contribution. But um, fascinating. Uh, really, living is fascinating. As long as you live and not just sit and let the world pass by. Yes. That's, uh, that's the whole secret of all of those things. And, uh, and beginning to, you know, looking at your, your, those three children and saying, well, this and so, well, this one, this one is, um, I don't know if you remember um, Captain Kangaroo. Oh, yes. Well, he had Mr. Green Jeans with him. My oldest son is, I always called him my Mr. Green Jeans. He was affable and uh, laid back, just sort of, you know, let it all mm -hmm. happen kind of thing. And, uh, and the other boy is all competition, total competition. He's out in Hollywood, he's a film editor. He's butting his head against all the things that that you have to do if you're going to make a mark mm -hmm. yeah. of any kind, and he wants to make a mark. And my daughter is the uh, the epitome of the good soul. She's uh, a nurse and works with the babies at oh. St. Peter's, and. Because you don't just work with the babies, you work with the moms and the sure. families because lots of stress with those um, families today. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she's our uh, Meals on Wheels person. Mm -hmm. She cooks and brings us goodies. Um, she's taking the day off today. She and one of her co-workers have gone to New York for the day. They're doing their own sightseeing kind of thing. Oh, well, that would be nice. Yes. It's a good day for it. It's a dry day, sunny day, cold, but mm -hmm. and New York City can be miserable in the cold mm -hmm. because there's all those tall buildings and the wind whips around and and um, but um, yes, that's one of the great joys of aging is to look around and see what happened as a result, maybe, of some of your efforts. And uh, one of the poets talked about the whirly gig of life, and um, it's, it's a whirly gig out there. It's, but we've got our, we've got our um, Christmas cards ordered and getting, beginning to think a little bit about all of those kinds of exciting things that will be coming again. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Was there any uh, any other photos or anything you wanted to add? Or oh, I wanted to, I wanted to find a couple, and I couldn't find I couldn't find the. I have about twenty albums. <laughs> <laughs> I did make a concerted effort about seven or eight years ago to go through. I had boxes and boxes of photos, yeah. and I um, I put them in. Who goes? Wh which uh, pictures go to which kid mm -hmm. and grandkid? And I got an album for each one of them and gave them the album. And I said, you know, it's up to you to share whatever. Yeah. I don't know that they've done that, but um, I, I 
been building my own <laughs> many albums here, and I couldn't find the right ones of, of when I was, um, particularly when I was uh, working at the war plant, and um, the coveralls and the, the steel-toed shoes, and mm -hmm. as I said, <laughs> with Rosie the Riveter kind of thing, it was, uh, it was I learned so much being around older people and how they how they were behaving in life. I mean, I was only 16 and uh, um, it was it was wonderful. I learned about work and contracts and all of these things that you know when I went back to school to finish high school, mm -hmm. I finished 3 years of high school in 2 years. And I didn't have these study halls because I wanted to graduate with my regular class. Mm -hmm. And um, they all seemed pretty silly and immature. They didn't understand anything about life. And I felt so old. <laughs> <laughs> but that was all great. It was served me in good stead. Okay. And, that was about a few seconds. Any anything in closing? No, I, I think you've I've, I've said everything quite well. I philosophized <laughs> enough. <laughs> I always had to say the blessing at our Thanksgiving when I was growing up because my mother always thought that I had the right thing to say and I had that responsibility. And um, uh, so I don't know. I I think I've said everything that I could possibly pull out. There are plenty of little things, but the mm -hmm. major pieces were there. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. We just